We will not stand by as our people are threatened by a kangaroo court. The U.S. imposes sanctions against the International Criminal Court, targeting its lawyers investigated suspected war crimes in Afghanistan. But what's behind President Donald Trump's move? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. The United States is facing criticism around the world for its latest threats against the International Criminal Court. President Donald Trump has signed an executive order sanctioning the ICC staff and their families. The US, which is not a member of the Hague-based tribunal, is angry at investigations into suspected war crimes in Afghanistan that could implicate its soldiers. The ICC called the sanctions an unprecedented attack. Rights groups are worried about the potential impact on international justice. We'll bring in our guests in a moment, but first, Rosalind Jordan has this report from Washington, D.C. The United States has never been a party to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. It says the court does not have the right to put U.S. citizens on trial for alleged crimes against humanity, war crimes, or genocide. But the Trump administration has gone further, calling the ICC corrupt, ineffective, and biased. We cannot and we will not stand by as our people are threatened by a kangaroo court. On Thursday, it imposed new sanctions on all ICC officials investigating the behavior of U.S. forces and CIA operatives in Afghanistan. It gives us no joy to punish them. But we cannot allow ICC officials and their families to come to the United States to shop and travel and otherwise enjoy American freedoms as these same officials seek to prosecute the defender of those very freedoms. The United States maintains the sovereign right and obligation to properly investigate and address any of our personnel's alleged violations of the laws of war. The new sanctions follow Washington's decision last year to revoke the travel visa of the ICC's chief prosecutor, Fatou Bansouda. She's been pushing for the investigation and possible trial of U.S. forces since 2017. Bansouda is also trying to prosecute the former Sudanese leader Omar al-Bashir for atrocities committed in Darfur. And she's investigating alleged Israeli war crimes in the occupied West Bank and Gaza, something the U.S. opposes. I think it's uh, the culmination of our evolution from a republic to an empire that believes that uh, we live by our standards and our alone. Uh, I don't think that we should look at this particular act of Mr. Trump in isolation. By targeting Bensouda's colleagues, the new U.S. sanctions raise questions about whether the court can actually do its job effectively. We've taken note with concern of these reports of the executive order uh, authorizing sanctions against certain individuals at the International Criminal Court. We'll obviously uh, continue to follow very closely uh, any developments on this issue. Human rights groups say the Trump administration's decision could harm their ability to help the most vulnerable in war zones. But for now, the U.S. has declared it can't trust the ICC to do the right thing, which is to carry out justice on American terms. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, Washington. Let's introduce the panel. In Vents in southeastern France, Fergal Gaynor, counsel at the International Criminal Court and legal representative of victims in Afghanistan. In Washington, D.C., Brett Schaefer, J. Kingham Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And in London, Toby Cadman, an international human rights lawyer and co-founder of the Guernica 37 at the International Justice Chambers. Welcome to you all. We will not stand by as our people are threatened by a kangaroo court. Incredibly strong words there from Mike Pompeo from the White House. Let's bring in Brett Schaefer uh, in Washington, D.C. right now. Brett, what is behind this move? There's, this is an extraordinary statement. Well, it's, it's a consistent U.S. policy. If you go back to 1998, when the Rome Statute was being negotiated, the United States was deeply involved in those negotiations. It voiced its objections to certain powers and uh, terms of that treaty that were going to be placed upon the court. 
and it decided to vote against the uh, the approval of that treaty. It's one of a uh, handful of countries that did that. The Clinton administration refused to sign the Rome Statute until the very last day possible. And when it did sign it, it, re it recommended that the Bush administration that followed not seek ratification because of serious flaws in that treaty. The Bush administration for two years tried to get some of those flaws addressed unsuccessfully. When the uh, International Criminal Court finally stood up in 2002, the U.S. unsigned the Rome Statute, which the Clinton administration had signed, to remove any vestigial legal obligations underneath that treaty, and then took specific actions to shield the United States from the power and authority and reach of the court, including passing the American Service Members Protection Act, which pro, uh, constrained U.S. cooperation with the ICC, it also entered into Article 98 agreements with over 100 countries around the world, which those countries agreed not to turn U.S. persons over to the court without U.S. consent. And then the United States uh, signaled over and over and over again through statements, through its actions, that it did not recognize the court's jurisdiction over the United States. And this is just a continuation of that policy that is extended through the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and now the Trump administration. Yeah, but that all was all, all of that is a negotiation with the ICC. It was the Americans saying, well, this is the problems with what we think is the ICC, the Rome Statutes. This is sanctions. This is an extraordinary one-sided done. We are done with this court completely. And it's also calling it a kangaroo court. There's no talking anymore, right? Well, this is the action that the court initiated. The United States worked for years with the court when there was a preliminary examination and then the announced investigation. It gave uh, it investigate all of the allegations that the U.S. government received in terms of crimes alleged to have been committed by U.S. persons in Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. reported over 600 different investigations, over 250 individuals that were held to account and punished in some way for allegations or for uh, abuses of prisoners that were found to be credible and sustained. The, the idea that the United States is not willing to hold its people to account and that the United States is not willing to uh, investigate these investigations is just patent nonsense. The United States has taken a number of different actions here. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the prosecutor's investigation report, all of the evidence that she provides is actually based on U.S. sources. It's based on the Senate Select Intelligence Committee. It's based on DOD uh, Department of Defense reports. It's, de uh, it's based on Inspector General reports. It's based on CIA Inspector General reports. All of the evidence that she has is actually based on U.S. reports and U.S. transparent efforts to actually hold people accountable and to be as cooperative as possible in the investigation efforts of these matters. The idea that she would come in and second guess this uh, the, this matter after the U.S. has gone through so much effort to try and hold individuals accountable is just nonsense. Well, let's bring in Fergal Gaynor here. He's a counsel for the International Criminal Court. You heard what Brett Schaefer had to say there, effectively saying we're investigating ourselves. We don't need you. What's your reaction? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to point out a couple of things. First of all, the U.S., engagement with the ICC has been a little more nuanced, uh, perhaps, than Mr. Schaefer said. Let's not forget that Dominic Ongwen was delivered to the court with the assistance of the U.S. government. Bosco and Taganda was delivered to the court with the assistance of the U.S. government. The United States co-sponsored uh, the referral of Libya to the ICC. The United States advocated for a referral of Syria to the ICC. And in many uh, part, in many situations, for example, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Northern Uganda and Myanmar, what the ICC is trying to achieve broadly aligns with U.S. interests. So, so the, the notion uh, that the uh, United States has, has been always opposed to the ICC uh, requires some, some correction. There has been a policy of constructive engagement, particularly uh, during the Obama administration. Now, more recently, yes, uh, the policy of the United States government has been a little more obstructive. Now, in the the Office of the Prosecutor's request... Um, the United States never abrogated its Article 98 agreements under the Obama administration. ASPA, the American Service Member Members Protection Act, still existed and still was applied to the U.S. U.S. cooperation with the ICC was still restricted by U.S. statute. 
And the United States also, even though it was willing to work with the uh, ICC in certain instances, that was all before the announcement of an official investigation that was uh, announced in November of 2017, the first year of the Trump administration. So to say that the United States was uh, acting in a, uh, inconsistently with its previous actions, I think, is, is wrong. But second, it was also instigated by the decision of the court itself. Fergal, please, carry uh, on. Yes, yes. Well, the, the, the Obama policy of constructive engagement with the ICC is, is very well documented. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that uh, the uh, United States has plenty of legal remedies which are set out in the Rome Statute to challenge the jurisdiction of the court on the basis that the United States is investigating and prosecuting the crimes at issue. It can make that challenge at any stage that it wants. It could have filed a challenge within the first month after the investigation uh, was authorized, but it also retains the, the right to challenge the court's jurisdiction on the very, for the very reasons that were put forward earlier that the court, that the US is investigating and prosecuting. But furthermore, we have to keep in mind that not only the office of the prosecutor, but all three judges of the pretrial chamber, and it appears all five judges of the appeals chamber, have all come to the conclusion that the steps which have been taken by the United States to date to investigate and prosecute the crimes at issue have not, in fact, uh, been sufficient. So the, but that still, the, even that finding is still open to challenge by the US. So what the US can do under the statute is continue to maintain its jurisdictional ob objections to the court, but to show the court about all of the uh, trials which have taken place or are taking place or are about to take place, the crimes for which people were convicted, the sentences to which those convicted uh, were required to serve. And then having done all that, the court is actually required to cease investigation. That's the principle of complementarity, which appears in the Rome Statute. I'll bring in Toby Cadman in London here in just a moment, but I want to ask Brett Schaefer, is this a case of OK, we'll work with the ICC when it's in our interest, but as long as the US is ring fence, as long as you don't investigate the US, then the ICC is kind of something, an institution we will work with. Is this consistent with President Donald Trump just not wanting any international agreements, not wanting to be part of any international agreement that encroaches on the US's sovereignty? No, I don't think so. And actually, uh, I... I... In response to the, the previous speaker's comments, the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute. The United States has decided not to ratify the Rome Statute, is not a party to the court, and therefore it has no legal obligation whatsoever to cooperate with this investigation, nor to cooperate or participate in the procedures outlined by the court. The idea that the United States should submit itself to the court's procedures just because the court exists, um, in essence, would be a tacit um, uh, recognition of the court's authority over the United States in the situation, which the U.S. has over and over and over again rejected. Toby uh, Cadman in London, is there any legal basis for these sanctions? Can President Trump actually do this? Any legal basis? Well, um, I mean, I think the the, the first point to, to recognize, um, as Fergal has already mentioned, that there are legal routes that could have been taken that the Trump administration has decided to ignore, um, despite what the, um, the, the guest in, in Washington said, they, they could have and still can exercise um, those legal challenges to the jurisdiction. Um, they've decided not to. Um, to simply say that the U.S. Is, has not signed and ratified the Rome Statute so, so it doesn't fall uh, within its jurisdiction, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's a very narrow a reading of the statute. Of course, if crimes occur on the state of of a state party, then the ICC has jurisdiction, um, irrespective of whether those crimes are committed by Taliban, Afghani, or or U.S. servicemen. So, so the ICC does have jurisdiction. Of course, their refusal to cooperate uh, makes it more difficult for the ICC to do its job, but it doesn't change the fact, and the investigations will go forward. But what, what we heard yesterday, I and mean, when we really have to look at this, is unprecedented. The attack on an, on an international, international court in such a way, um, and, and as the response from the ICC has, has made clear, that they consider this to be 
an attack on the administration of justice. You know, we haven't seen this with the Philippines. We haven't seen this with Venezuela, Myanmar, and these countries that are also under investigation and in which challenges have been made. Um, so for the U.S. to do this, um, I think, is is truly astonishing. And, and, and deeply worrying, because it's, it's not just what will happen now to ICC personnel and all of those human rights groups that support the work, but it's going to empower dictatorships and autocracies around the world um, to, to act in a similar way um, in, 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 in terms of international justice, and that is, that is deeply worrying. Um, I don't think the U.S. has the right to, to call itself uh, uh, respecting the rule of law when it makes such a decision such as this. It is, it is very worrying. Brett, let me bring in uh, you here. It's not just against the ICC staff themselves, but their families as well. I mean, Toby makes a good point that, you know, the US should be seen to be upholding uh, the rule of law, and this is a, a, an attack, effectively, not just on the ICC, but their families as well. You should understand this from the perspective of the United States. This is an attack of the court on the U.S. itself. This is an attempt by the court to assert jurisdiction where the United States has specifically said that we reject that jurisdiction. This is a, an instance of the United States upholding international law, which says that the United, any country is only legally bound by treaties that it is actually agreed to be bound by through the ratification process. That is not the case here. In fact, Afghanistan itself hasn't invited the court to ex exercise its jurisdiction in this case. The court itself has asserted itself through the prosecutor's powers under the treaty to uh, in uh, launch an investigation of her own authority. That is the process. This is the court itself launching an investigation, not at the behest of the United States, not at the behest of the Afghanistan government, of its own authority. And this is also a, a case where international law is far from clear. The Afghanistan uh, ratified the, US, uh, the Rome Statute to the ICC, but prior to that, the United States had secured a treaty, a status of forces agreement with Afghanistan that granted it exclusive jurisdiction over U.S. military personnel in that country. This is a pre-existing agreement, and the ICC and the Rome Statute itself envisions that these pre-existing agreements should not be abrogated just by the ratification of the ICC. That's the exact... Um, understanding, because in international law, treaties are equal, and Afghanistan has the authority to grant uh, or extend uh, its jurisdiction in these matters to courts like the ICC, but it had already done so in the case of the United States and the other uh, members of NATO who are fighting in that country. Let's bring in Fergal Gaynor here. Um, what you heard from Washington, D.C., is this is an attack on the U.S. Is the ICC attacking the U.S.? The ICC is certainly not attacking the US. No, nobody's suggesting that the United States is, is required to cooperate with the ICC. It, it's, it's not a state party, but uh, it, it would be uh, the constructive way forward. Now, just on the question of pre-existing treaty obligations, yes, Afghanistan has pre-existing uh, treaty obligations with respect to the US and other NATO countries. And the Rome Statute does ex make express provision for consideration of pre-existing treaty obligations. It certainly does not state that pre-existing treaty obligations somehow rob the Rome Statute uh, of any effect whatsoever. A pre-existing treaty obligation does not trump the Rome Statute. What should happen in the case of a pre-existing treaty obligation is for the country in question, in this case Afghanistan, because at least it is a state party, should bring its legal arguments before the court concerning the effect of, of status of forces agreements or Article 98 agreements or whatever agreement it wishes to rely upon. And then the matter can be, can be ruled upon. Uh, but certainly what I would encourage is uh, for this uh, entire dispute to be resolved through legal means, which are set out in the Rome Statute, which, as Mr. Sheffern pointed out, was in fact uh, brought to conclusion with very strong American involvement. And the, uh, America, the United States of America also joined consensus in concluding the rules of procedure and evidence and the elements of crimes of the court. So the, the, the fingerprints of the American negotiators are all over the Rome Statute. And now it's time for the US to use the actual mechanisms which are set out in the Rome Statute in defense of its own legitimate interests. Let's bring in Toby Cadman here in London. What can the ICC do next in order to resolve this situation? And will the Americans listen? 
Well, I think you, you've also got to understand that you know we're not we're not too far away uh, from an election, and so there may be um, uh, motives for doing this now that are that are not um, solely related to to the Afghanistan investigation. Um, I think what we've seen is that the ICC will continue to do its work. It will continue to move forward, uh, and if it considers that anyone should be charged. Um, whether they are Taliban, Afghan military, or, or, or U.S. military, then then they will charge them. Um, um, and I think, as an independent and impartial institution, it will proceed in that way. Um, of course, there will be a period of of diplomatic discussions between um, the the ICC and the United States, and probably a number of um, states will get involved as well. Um, to, to try and convince the Trump administration to, to back down. Um, I don't think the Trump administration will back down. I think they've made that point very clear. But you've also got to understand the allegations that have been made against the prosecutor in particular are of the most serious nature. They have effectively accused the prosecutor of an international tribunal of being corrupt because they have said that they have credible evidence of corruption at the highest level. Well, the prosecutor is the highest level, so that's effectively what they are suggesting. Um, so I think it's going to be very, very difficult to scale, to scale down from this. Whether it will be challenged in the United States, whether there will be uh, any kind of uh, action through Congress is, is not a matter that I can answer. But certainly, I don't see that it will have an impact on the investigation going forward. And just to comment on what the last two speakers have said in terms of um, the sober agreements and, and, and whatever other kind of treaties were enforced at the time, we're talking about torture. We're talking about war crimes. So that has to be taken into account that those crimes are of the, of the most serious, of the greatest nature. So, of course, there is the opportunity for the United States to, to uh, challenge this in the ordinary course of um, legal proceedings, but we have to consider that these are allegations of the most serious kind. So, for the U.S. to be shielding any potential suspect from prosecution for the most serious allegations, that in itself should disturb all of us. Uh, gentlemen, we are running out of time, but I do want to just get one more answer from Brett Schaefer here. Brett, kangaroo courts, corruption at the highest levels, sanctions against not only staff but families as well. These are unprecedented steps. Strategically, do you think the U.S. is playing this the right way? Is Pompeo, is uh, the, uh, and Donald Trump playing this the right way? Or is this simply an over, over, overstep? Uh, actually, I don't know anything about what their, the specifics about the allegations of corruption at the highest levels of the court are. There wasn't any elaboration on that during the, uh, the press uh, comment last yesterday or the press uh, uh, session yesterday and uh, and in the subsequent statements there hasn't been anything either um, but I think it's fair to note that this would not be unprecedented for the International Criminal Court uh, uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo uh, has been charged with all sorts of questionable ethical behavior uh, in regards to uh, his actions after leaving the office of the prosecutor and during um, and in fact, in fact, I think uh, Prosecutor Bensuda actually had to issue a statement of, of either condemnation or censure or uh, just uh, uh, criticism of him in the aftermath of, of several of those allegations. So the idea that the that the ICC or that high level ICC officials might be immune to temptation of corruption or uh, are above uh, taking ethical uh, ethically qu uh, questionable actions, I think is uh, is. Is, is certainly not the case. We are running out of time. I do have to say that there have been no uh, charges of uh, corruption uh, brought against the ICC. Just have to make that clear. Uh, thanks to all our guests, Virgil Gaynor, Brett Schaefer and Toby Cadman. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here, bye for now.